Hi, this is Rick, and this is Burn After Reading. Before I get into the Beverly Lynn Smith murder case, let me address why I'm doing this series. If you've followed my episodes, you know I mainly cover issues that deal with misinformation on true crime cases. This, unfortunately, is another one. In May of 2022, Prime Video released a four-part docuseries called The Unsolved Murder of Beverly Lynn Smith. As I was watching episodes, I couldn't help but get that old familiar feeling that this was being constructed very similar to the Paradise Lost series and the Making a Murderer series. The film painted murderer suspect Alan Smith as the victim of police tunnel vision. The film portrayed law enforcement as people who would stop at nothing to get their man, be they right or wrong. In the trailer for the series, Al can be heard proclaiming that they took a decent man and they shredded him. However, if you follow this series and whether you believe in his innocence or guilt, I believe I can make a strong argument that Alan's claim may not necessarily be true. In fact, quite contrary. The film cherry-picked audio recordings from the undercover sting operation that would not paint the entire story. Over 300 hours of audio was played in court. The film series left out shocking statements made by Alan, both related and unrelated to Beverly. This will be something I will cover in a future episode. Unlike the docuseries I previously mentioned, Alan Smith would not be convicted. Why? Again, we'll get into that later. In addition to the series' slanted tone, they even got her middle name wrong. They spelt her middle name L-Y-N-N, when it is in fact L-Y-N. That's a mistake I'm not going to make. And this was a mistake that was brought to their attention, but never corrected. In fact, they tried to justify it, with documents that still were incorrect. And despite the proof that Beverly's daughter, Rebecca, showed, it still wasn't corrected. And it should have been. After the Prime Video release, podcasters and YouTubers would come about producing their own episodes of Beverly's case, parroting just about everything the Prime Video series laid out instead of actually doing their own research. Despite Beverly's daughter, Rebecca, reaching out to these podcasters and YouTubers, she was ignored. Can't let family members of a murder victim get in the way of content, right? Some of these names who covered the case includes True Crime Guys, True Crime and Cocktails, True True Crime Squad, and Sherry Lynn Dale, who is, I believe, the most popular among them. They told their side of the story. Now, I'm going to tell you what they didn't. I'm going to tell you what changes everything you've heard or knew about this case. But to get there, we have to start from the beginning and work our way up to it. So without further ado, here's part one of the murder of Beverly Lynn Smith, the other side of the story. I've got a lot to say, can't hold it in this time Got no filter, I got no filter 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 On the evening of December 9, 1974, in small town Raglan, Ontario, a young woman's life was unjustly stolen from her, fatally shot in the back of the head in her very own home. That woman was Beverly Lynn Smith. She was only 22 years old. She was the wife of Doug, who worked the night shift at the General Motors plant in Oshawa. She was the mother of her only child, Rebecca, who was 10 months old at the time 
and was in the house when the crime occurred. She was the daughter of Helen and Nelson. She was the sister of Wendy, Susan, and Barbara. Barbara was her identical twin who she shared a very deep bond with. Beverly was slender and petite. She had flowing red hair and freckles adorned her fair-skinned face, adding contrast along with her beautiful, dark green eyes. Those who knew or met Beverly considered her shy yet sunny. Beverly was very quick-witted. She was a very talented artist and could draw someone's portrait so well you would think it was a photograph rather than a sketch. She was also crafty and could sew. She made clothes, be it her very own wedding dress or clothes for her sister Wendy because she didn't have anything to wear for school in the ninth grade. She also liked antiquing. Beverly was a stay-at-home mom at the time, but she previously worked a government office job in Oshawa. She had to quit her job after discovering her husband was having a fling with their babysitter's best friend. Beverly had a gut feeling that something was going on, and when their babysitter asked if Bev could mail a letter for her, she decided to open it and read it, feeling she might get some answers. Beverly's instincts were correct. Uh, in the letter, the babysitter discussed having a fling with Doug's friend, Ashley Spicer, a married man who lived across the street from them. It also turned out that the letter discussed Doug's fling with the babysitter's best friend, and so obviously the babysitter's services were no longer required. But it left them without someone to watch Rebecca, hence why Beverly had to quit her job. Doug was ashamed about the cheating. He was on Valium at the time, and he went to a hospital for two weeks in order to kick the habit. He wanted to fix his marriage. He loved Beverly. He just made a stupid mistake. Due to being down to one income, Doug eventually got in a selling pot for supplemental money. Also worth mentioning, Beverly very much feared being home alone. I mean, yes, she had her daughter Rebecca with her, but I mean alone in the sense as the only adult in the house. Most of her life, she lived in a house full of people. So, now being home with only her daughter, she always kept the doors locked for her and Rebecca's safety. Sadly, this fear would turn into a terrible reality. On the day leading up to Beverly's murder, Beverly and Doug, along with baby Rebecca, went to an open house with the intent of buying the home. After that, they ran some errands and then ended back home where they put Rebecca down for a nap while taking one of their own while cuddling on the couch. Napping longer than expected, Rebecca woke up eventually alerting the parents. They realized they overslept and Doug had to rush to get ready for work. While he was getting ready, Beverly fried up some hot dogs for his work lunch. At around 5.30 p.m., Doug kissed both Beverly and Rebecca goodbye as he hopped in his car. Beverly held Rebecca as they stood by the window as Mom had her baby girl wave bye-bye to Dad. Doug pulled out and left for work so that he can be there by 6. Little did he know it would be the last time he would see his wife alive. After that, Beverly worked on some Christmas cards and talked on the phone with her mother Helen and then her twin sister Barb. She was off the phone sometime around 7.10 to 7.15. It would later be revealed that Beverly wanted to spend some time with her mother and Barbara, but her mother had Christmas shopping to do, and Barbara was going on a date. At 8.30 p.m., Doug went on break to call Beverly, but his wife didn't answer. Doug then called the Spicers, who lived across the street from them. The Spicers were on vacation at the time, but Alan and Linda Smith, no relation to Doug and Beverly, were staying there. The Spicers offered their home to Alan and Linda after they were falling on hard times and Linda being pregnant. Doug and Rebecca knew Alan and Linda through the Spicers and weren't so much friends as they were mere acquaintances. 
Beverly would sometimes go over to the Spicers to play cards or to hang out when Doug was working. So it would be reasonable to, reasonable to believe that maybe Beverly was over there at the moment. Linda picked up the phone and Doug asked if Beverly was there. Linda said she was not. Doug thought it was a bit odd, but thought maybe she went over to her mother's house. Linda suggested that maybe Beverly was doing laundry. She recalled talking to her earlier in the day and that it was one of the tasks that needed to be done. And maybe that's why Beverly didn't hear the phone ringing. Linda volunteered to go across the street and knock on the door, but Doug said that she didn't have to do that and he would just call her back on his next break. But Linda insisted. She told Doug to stay on the line as she crossed the street to their home. According to Linda, when she made it over there, the door was locked and the lights were on. She knocked, but no one answered. As she started to make her way back, she caught a quick gl glance inside the kitchen window and noticed Beverly motionless on the floor with blood present originating from the back of the head. After noticing this, Linda quickly made her way back to her house, grabbed the phone, and told Doug he needed to get home right away because she thought Beverly had an accident. After this, Linda went to Al, her husband, and told him to go over to the house to check on Beverly. Again, according to Linda, when Al came back from across the street, he told Linda to call the ambulance and tell him he would have his Humane Society work van pulled into Beverly and Doug's driveway with his amber rooftop flashing lights on. The ambulance arrived and two men stepped out. Jim Ewan and Bill Cosburn was their names. Al was at the house waiting for them, and there would be some discrepancies on who actually kicked the door open to get inside. Al told one of the investigators later that night that he was the one to do it, but many years later he recanted that statement. Regardless of who kicked the door in, Al told the two ambulance attendants that there was a baby inside the home. There they found Beverly on the floor with a pool of blood next to her head. She had no vitals, but Jim Ewan attempted to revive her by performing CPR as Bill Cosburn checked around the house. Cosburn found a whimpering baby Rebecca in the living room. He scooped her up, put her inside his jacket, and eventually gave her to Linda Smith to look after. Doug finally made it home and attempted to rush inside, but was restrained by some people in the crowd. Investigators Doug aired and Richard Stanford of the Durham Police Detective Office were the first to arrive on scene. A source told me that they were intoxicated coming straight from a Christmas party. The investigators convinced Doug to wait inside a cruiser to hopefully calm himself as they started investigating the crime scene. Investigators noticed during their inspection the damaged frame around the exterior door. Aird asked neighbor Al Smith about it, and he said he kicked it in to allow the ambulance attendants inside. Like I said earlier, Al would recant this. Why? Anyways, investigators initially thought Beverly was the victim of sexual assault due to her blouse being torn. They even collected hairs and other things, but investigators would later learn the torn blouse was due to one of the EMTs giving CPR to Beverly. Upon initial sight, they wouldn't know exactly what caused the fatal injury. They thought maybe someone caved her head in, possibly with a blunt instrument. Um, but it would later be known, later in the autopsy, the cause of injury was determined to come from a Kui model rifle. Aird found some pot in a bag in a kitchen in a drawer. He headed upstairs of the house and in a spare bedroom he discovered several baggies of pot estimated to be around give or take about a half pound inside a dresser drawer. More cops eventually arrived and did a canvas of the neighborhood. Oddly enough no one heard any gunshots or anything out of the ordinary. After midnight Beverly's twin sister Barb arrived on scene looking for Rebecca. She found her at the Spicer's residence. She went inside. Linda was in the middle of changing Rebecca into a new outfit, while Al was pacing back and forth behind her. 
Barb, distraught and confused, asked Linda what happened. Linda stopped, held up her hand towards Barbara, and told her she didn't want to talk about it. A weird statement. Wasn't the twin of Beverly entitled to some answers? Later, Aird would return to the station with Beverly's husband, Doug, and neighbor, Al Smith. Both were questioned. Eventually, Nelson, the father of Beverly, arrived at the station and demanded they let Doug the hell out of there. Doug was allowed to leave and left with Nelson. Doug Smith was eventually ruled out as a suspect, as he had a solid alibi. Even being seen sprinting out of the plant as soon as he heard something happened to his wife. Later in the investigation, Aird brought up the pot found in the home. Doug offered up some information that would give a possible motive to the murders. Doug told Aird that he bought a pound of pot from a guy named Doug Daigle the Saturday before the murder. Beverly's husband, Doug, said that he would sell it by the ounce and had around 13 ounces left on the day of the murder. This was odd since Aird only discovered about six ounces in the house, meaning that the murderer had to have taken some, at least seven ounces. But why would the murderer take only some of it? Why not all? This would be a lingering question. Investigators would go on to question Doug Smith's friends and associates. Um, some of those people, um, as I mentioned before, Doug Daigle was one, Rick Ostrom, Mark Kenny, and a guy named Jeff Zarek. Hopefully I'm saying his name right, but it's spelled C-Z-Y-R-U-K. Um, and with the exception of Doug Daigle, I'm not going to go into these people. Instead, I will defer to a book called The Coldest Case by Jeff Mitchell. There are things missing in the book, but he does cover these people. I just don't want to waste too much time going over dead ends. That's just what true, pro, you know, true crime podcasters do so that they can obloviate cases so they can make money off their you know, audience and sponsorships. I'm just not interested in that. I'd rather get into the meat and potatoes of everything that's going to lead into what we're about to discuss. Anyways, Beverly was an unlikely homicide victim. She was a young mother with no known enemies. There was no sign of a struggle in the house, and it was well known that Beverly kept her doors locked, especially when Doug was working the night shift. There was no sign of forced entry other than the kicked-in door, which Al provided an explanation for which indicated Beverly most likely opened the door for her killer. Someone she most likely knew and trusted enough to let in. In 1975, the case would go cold. It wouldn't be until 1987 when the case would become more active. I'm taking the following from Jeff Mitchell's book, The Coldest Case. I referred to it earlier, and while it doesn't cover everything, it's a good starting point if you want to learn the basics. I'll provide a link in the description page. Durham police detectives Tony Turner and Doug King went back into the case files. They looked at names who were considered good suspects at the time, and Doug Daigle's name stood out to the detectives. Thing is, Daigle had an alibi on the night of the murder. He was at home all night in his apartment with Georgina Clus. Georgina confirmed Daigle was with her from 5.30 p.m. until midnight in a statement given in 1975. Daigle heard about the murder when a man named Doug Harper called and told him about it. In January 1988, the detectives re-interviewed Georgina. Her memory was fuzzy, and she couldn't recall the things that she said. I mean, after all, we're talking about memories from 1975 to 1988, so that's actually understandable. She didn't recall giving a statement to the police in 1975, nor did she remember signing a statement to an officer who wrote up the report. Perhaps just sloppy police work at the time, but Georgina assured Turner and King she wouldn't have lied to the police. She did question whether she stayed that long with Daigle due to her kids being home, but she did not deny being there. Cops also interviewed Doug Harper. He said it was a long time ago, but he didn't really have too many kind things to say about Doug Daigle. He thought he was a fuck-up who couldn't hold a job. 
He didn't recall ever calling him that night, uh, telling him about the murders. Again, memories can be fuzzy and misleading. We have cops interviewing a guy in 1988 about an event that took place in the final month of 1974. This, though, along with Georgina's new statement, Turner and King felt Daigle's alibi was in question. In February 1988, Turner and King also made efforts to find transcripts of the wiretaps that had been conducted in the mid-70s. They spoke to John Kay, by then an officer with the Durham police, who told Turner about an alarming statement cops heard when bugging Daigle's phone. The cops heard him say, I may have done it. I may have shot her. I might have been there. I don't know. I was stoned. However, despite... Kay's claim, there were some issues. There was no transcript of the interception, nor did it exist on tape. The only reference to the statement was in a report by officers who claimed they heard it. Turner contacted Reg McIntyre and Reg Webster, the surveillance cops who said they overheard the statement. Both remembered the incident. The problem was that although the police had reproduced page upon page of intercepted conversations, the one Turner was most interested in didn't exist. There was no transcript of anyone uttering the words the surveillance cops said they heard. Turner settled for the next best thing, obtaining statements from the intelligence officers that could potentially be used in court. So, let's see what else was used to make a case against Daigle. Well, in February 1987, a woman called the Durham Police Crime Stoppers line to say that she heard from a source that Daigle was the killer. The source, according to the caller, knew what happened but was afraid to come forward. In March 1988, Turner and King interviewed a guy named Nick Popovics, who had lived at Daigle's place in Enniskillen for a time in the 70s. He told the cops Daigle freaked out at the time of the killing. Also in March of 1988, a guy named Edward Amy said that he was well acquainted with Daigle and the drug scene back in the 70s. He told Turner and King he also recalled people speculating about Daigle. Amy said when Doug was on dust, he would flip out, talk to spaceships, and lose complete control of himself. A woman who dated Daigle in the early 80s told police that he was a drug dealer who kept guns for protection and wasn't averse to sampling his own wares. When Doug was on PCP, he would flip right out and not remember things the next day. Daigle's own father told police that in 1974, he owned two 22 caliber Cooey rifles. He kept the guns at home, but admitted someone could have taken one without him noticing. Turner and King talked to another ex of Daigle's named Lee Eggleton. They hypnotized her, and she claimed Daigle told her about someone in Raglan who had ripped him off in a drug deal. In another interview, Eggleton, along with Kathy Shaw, told the police they'd heard Daigle make statements about killing someone. Eggleton said Daigle had talked about killing a young woman in the country. Shaw said he'd claimed already to have killed a woman who'd pissed him off and threatened he wouldn't be afraid to do the same to her. She also said that whenever talk of the murder came up at a party or gathering, Daigle would fall silent or try to change the subject. Police noticed some phone records of Daigle's apartment to Beverly's house, especially when Doug Smith was working at the GM plant. However, the specifics were not detailed in Jeff's book. Was that just in general or specifically the night of the murder? I honestly can't say. Turner and King would also interview Al and Linda Smith, the former neighbors who discovered Beverly that tragic night on December 9, 1974. They no longer lived in Raglan. They were now residents of Coburg. Al and Linda cast doubt on Doug Daigle being the one to have committed the crime, claiming that Oshawa cops had tunnel vision. The police went over Al and Linda's statements, and everything was fine up until the part where Al Smith kicked in the door for the ambulance attendants to go in. Al said that if he said that in his statement, he would like to retract it. A very odd statement. 
Then, after all of this, Al started to think that maybe Doug Daigle was capable of the murder. Here's another interesting tidbit. The cops asked if Al and Linda ever saw Daigle or his car at Beverly's house around the time of the murder. Al replied that, yes, he'd seen that car in Raglan a couple of times, but Linda wasn't so sure. At least she didn't think that Daigle had been at the house when Doug Smith wasn't at home. Al quickly refuted that Linda didn't know that for sure. Interesting how Al goes from Daigle couldn't have done it to perhaps maybe he did and goes as far as to counter Linda's memory. I mean, sure, it was a long time ago, but Al's persistence should be of note. After this, Turner and King became more convinced that they were on the right track and headed to British Columbia, where Doug Daigle was living. Daigle met with Turner and King at the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Detachment in Sunich on March 11th. They told him Georgina Cluse recanted her initial statement that she'd been with Daigle on the night of the murder. Of course, this would be misleading. She told them she couldn't remember giving that statement at the time. Still, the police were trying to discredit Daigle's alibi. They also told Daigle they had a witness who placed him at Doug and Beverly's house the day of the murder. Daigle maintained his innocence, but started doubting his own memory. If Georgina wasn't with him, then he must have been home alone. Still, Daigle would deny murdering Beverly. Daigle returned to take a polygraph test a few days later. The results would end up inconclusive. Turner took Daigle into an interrogation room, and that's when things would start to heat up. Turner came out with it and accused Doug Daigle of the murder of Beverly Lynn Smith. He told Daigle he was going to suffer hard times in prison, and he'd be a lifer. He told him to think about his poor mother, but despite what tactic Turner used, Daigle called his bluff, he told him he had nothing to do with it, he was mistaken, and he maintained his innocence from beginning to end. After the interrogation, Daigle was arrested and put in a jail cell with an undercover cop acting as a fellow cellmate. The cops were hoping Daigle would confide in him. But... Daigle didn't confess to anything. He was confused, however, by Georgina's retraction. Now, keep in mind, it wasn't a retraction, so the confusion had merit. He thought maybe she was bitter about how things turned out. He told his cellmate that he may have to go back to Ontario to deal with this murder beef, but he was absolutely sure he'd be exonerated. He also said his ex was telling cops things and making things up. As the undercover cop kept pushing the envelope to see if Daigle would slip up, Daigle informed him that his lawyer told him not to say anything and that the cells were wired to hear conversations. In the end, Turner called Crown Attorney John Scott back in the Durham region and informed him what he had on Doug Daigle. Scott's conclusion was that there wasn't anything sufficient, and Daigle was let go the next morning. No formal charges would ever be made against Daigle of the murder of Beverly Lynn Smith. Turner and King would continue to work their case against Daigle for the next several months, but there just wasn't anything. In 1990, Doug Smith thought 16-year-old Rebecca was old enough to know more about her mother's murder and took her to talk to a detective about it at the Durham Police Department. During this meeting, the detective noticed how much Rebecca looked like her mom and asked Doug if they could have Rebecca walk down Daigle Street to see if it would invoke a reaction. Doug was understandably dead set against it. If Daigle was Beverly's murderer, he would not put his daughter in any danger. The case against Doug Daigle would eventually come to a dead end. The case wouldn't get any significant traction again until the 2000s. In the next episode, I will cover how in 2003, Durham Regional Police Service Detective Leon Lynch was directed to review the case with the intention of relaunching the investigation, which eventually led him to a new suspect. Alan Smith, the former neighbor of Beverly. Until next time.